And uh, got Brother Radish here on the other line. And I'm going to ask him to pray for us. Brother, if you would. Amen. All right. Well, let's go ahead and play a song. I'm, uh, I hope my nephew's doing well from his surgery, getting some rest. Amen. All right. Let's see. all we see his face.
amen, it would be worth it all when we see his face. You know, a lot of people don't have that hope. And all of the hope they have is in this world today. And they, uh, they're miserable. And they've got no joy. They're worried about every little thing except what they ought to be worried about the most. Go ahead, girls. Good evening, everyone. Evening. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the Savior, the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing love, just in sin no safe to plunge me. Need the healing, cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, it's sweet to trust in Jesus. Just from sin and self to seek, just from Jesus simply take him, life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Amen. All right, if you got your Bible, turn to John in chapter 3, the Gospel of John chapter 3. I want to catch one verse there. You know, I'm listening to all this stuff from the left and from the right and everything that's supposedly going on and what people are going to do. Uh, what they think President Trump's going to do before uh, the 20th and all that. And You know, I, I, I really see that the way the left is going, uh, it just might come one day to arms because... They want to shut up every conservative, every Christian, every Bible-believing preacher. And uh, they're not going to stop. Already, Forbes magazine said, told companies that they better not hire anybody uh, that worked in the Trump administration or anything to do with him. Uh I look at this and I say, well, Lord, you're in control. And I said, I've got a hope. I've got a hope. And I really believe that the end is really drawing near. And what we need to focus on right now are souls of men. We need to reach people for the Lord Jesus Christ before it's too late. You know, there's people out here and, and some of my relatives that they say they believe in God, but there's no fruit in their life. Uh, they don't attend church. Uh, I've heard people say, well, you don't have to go to church 
to be saved. No, but if you are saved, you're going to want to be in church. And uh, they worry about everything under the sun except the sun. Amen. In John chapter 3 and verse 36, the last verse of that chapter, he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Amen. He that believeth. Now, what does it mean to believe? And oh, by the way, I, I wanted to mention this tonight. You know, if all these liberals hate the conservatives so much, why don't the truckers and the farmers quit shipping their food and produce to these liberal cities? Because they're not the sorry ones that do the work. It's the Bible-believing Christians, the conservatives that go out there and work hard all day. Not these people sitting here waiting on a government paycheck. Amen? So, uh, anyway, I just had to get that off my chest. Amen? Again, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You know, there's people that believe in total annihilation, and there's people that believe in universal universalism. Uh, universalism, they think that God's going to bring it all back around, even for those that didn't believe on the Son, and everything's going to be wonderful. Uh, not the case. Those that believe in Total annihilation is that, you know, you're just going to be consumed and it'll be all over. But that verse right there, chapter 3, verse 36, uh, it actually uh, makes a liar out of both of those theories. This says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That means forever and ever, he that believeth. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. He's not going to see life. He'll see eternal judgment, eternal damnation, but he'll not see life. And it says, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It's going to abide on him continually. Amen. Eternal damnation. But the verse starts out with he that believeth. And I asked the question, what does it mean to believe? Over in the book of James, in chapter 2 and verse 19, the Bible says, thou believest that there is one God. He says, thou doest well. Said the devils also believe and tremble. So just because you say you believe, you're not saying anything more than the devils. But what does it really mean to believe? I wanted to go back to James chapter 1, and I wanted to read down through James chapter 1 and 2. And I want you to examine yourself. Paul says to examine yourself to see if you be of the faith. You know, just because you say, uh, I know God, I love God, I pray to God, uh, doesn't mean that you're on your way to heaven. I said that for years. I said, I always believed that Jesus died on the cross. I was brought up that way. I was taught that in Sunday school. But I never knew that Jesus is God. I knew he was the son of God. But I didn't know that he is God manifest in the flesh. And so I always believed in a babe that was laid in a manger and was born and that grew up and died and was buried and rose again the third day. But I didn't really know him. And I was later in life made a few professions and, and I used to always think that as long as I did pretty good, I'd be all right. And if I got, if I quit doing this and doing that, I was saved. And uh, I'd go to church on Sundays if I had time. And uh, I would think that I was all right. And if I wanted to get into sin, I'd just figure, well, I just pray that I live through this and then I'll just get saved again because if I sin, I could lose it. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Amen. But that's how the lost world thinks. And and then there'd be where we look at others and say, well, you know, I might not be doing right, but I'm not as bad as that person over there. 
The Bible says they that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. But I'm going to start in James chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now Paul says that all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and truly furnished unto all good works. Now, he says to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, I believe that the book of Hebrews that Paul wrote and the book of James here are going to be tribulation books that the Lord uses to try to reach his people. You can believe whatever you want. That's what I believe. But it's still talking to you today. And this is what he says. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. What do you mean upbraideth not? He's not going to charge you for asking. Amen. He wants you to ask. He wants to give you wisdom. He says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. But the rich that he is made low because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. You know, I'm 68 years old, and it seems like I was 16 yesterday. And you know, tomorrow if I live, I might make 76, who knows? Or I might not make it at all. But time is, just flies by. What did he say? He says, we're like the flower of the grass. He shall pass away. He says, for what is our life? Is even a as a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. Now he says, but the rich that he is made low because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away for the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass and the flower thereof falleth and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Who's the enticer? Huh? Who's the enticer? See, we've all got this lust in this. There's no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. He says, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will beget he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And he tells us to, he says, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and, with, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Well, what is the engrafted word? Well, John 1, uh, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And then in John 1, 14, he says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, what was made flesh? The word. Well, what's he say here? He says, receive with meekness the engrafted word. What's it mean to be engrafted? Any of you that have been in horticulture and, and stuff, you know, uh, for instance, uh, when they came out with a tangelo, they took a tangerine and an orange, tree and they put it together and they come up with a tangelo but you see that thing is sterile and it can't reproduce they got to start all over again but they grafted it in and it became something different well 
God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, in order to redeem us, the human race, he had to be a near kinsman according to his own law. So what did he do? He was grafted into the human race. Amen. And then he grafts us in to the godly race. So he's the engrafted word. That's why the Bible says in Luke chapter one, that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God. Now he says, now look at verse 22. You say you believe. Well, James says in chapter two, again, in verse 10, that thou believest in one God, thou do as well. He said the devils also believe and they tremble. But to be a believer means that you must produce something in your life, not to be saved, but because you are saved. He says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Do you realize that you can deceive your own self? I mean, people walk around, talk about, oh, I love God. I know, I believe that God's, you know, going to uh, come back. I believe that in the person of Jesus, I believe he's going to call out the church. But the problem is you're never in church. Amen. But he said, be you doer, <clears throat> excuse me, doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridle not his tongue, I mean, can't stop his cussing. He can't stop whatever it is in his, that comes out of his mouth that's not edifying. But he says that bridle not his tongue, but deceive with his own heart. This man's religion is vain. Now he said pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless. All right, some of you people help the fatherless. You help young people, children, and widows. Yeah, you've gone and helped widows. You've gone to the nursing home. That's all fine. It says widows in their affliction. But what about this one? And to keep himself unspotted from the world. You still out there in the world? You still loving the world? You still dressing like the world? You acting like the world? Talking like the world? Walking like the world? We're supposed to be a peculiar people. Now look at James chapter 2. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and that's not gay like the faggots, that's gay as in nice clothing, happy. <laughs> And say unto him, sit thou here in a good place and say to the poor, stand thou there or sit here under my footstool. Are you then not partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the laws as transgressors. Now look at this. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of what? Says he's guilty of all. He's guilty of all. Now, I know you folks that tune into this Bible study, you're doing it so you can hear the word of God. Amen. So uh, if you're texting everybody back and forth, you might miss the one thing you need. Just saying. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become the transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy 
rejoices against judgment. What does it profit? What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, look at this now, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. What's the Bible say? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But if you are saved, it's supposed to produce works. So, what's it mean to believe? Do you believe? Do you believe this book? Do you believe what it says? Are you doing what it says? He says, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. James says, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Now, I didn't say that. James said it. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered up Isaac, his son, upon the altar? I mean, did not God promise that he was going to give him a son and that that son was going to raise up a, a great and mighty nation? Of course he did. What did God tell him? Take him up here where I'm going to point you and sacrifice him for a burnt offering. And Abraham didn't mess around. He got up first thing in the morning, saddled his ass, took the servant and his son and the wood and the fire and headed up. You know why? Because he believed God. Therefore, because of his belief that God would do what he said he would do, though he slay Isaac, that God was able to raise him from the dead. So you see how the faith produce works. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Could you imagine having that testimony being called the friend of God? You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only? Likewise also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So you say you believe. How much do you believe? Has it produced works in your life for the cause of Christ to further in the kingdom of God? If the church was dependent on you, would there be a church as far as growing? I mean, the church as a body is made up of members. And Paul says that we all have our parts that provide for the needs of the church, that the church can function. Are you doing your part? Does your faith have works? So, how much do you believe? You say, well, I called upon the name of the Lord. Well, the Bible says, for whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Now I should believe except they hear. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And what should he preach? You see, that verse there in Romans 10 that says, whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved doesn't mean, okay, Lord, save me. No, they got to know why they need to call on him. They got to know that they're sinners. They have to be willing to repent. And that's what the preacher does. He comes and God said he chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. So I ask you again tonight, how much do you believe? 
Do you care enough to please the Lord and ask him what he thinks of how you dress, how you walk, how you talk, what you do in church? He said the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. So how much do you really believe? Examine yourself. I'm telling you, things are fixing to get tough. And if you don't have that eternal hope through the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be miserable. You're going to be afraid, frightened, scared of whatever. But you can have perfect peace in him. It's like we said before, and I've heard it in a song. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. Amen. All right. Well, I'm like an overbaked cookie. I'm done. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this evening. I thank you for all the folks that tuned in. And I pray, Lord, that you'd bless them. I pray, Father, that you would uh, help them with their needs. Anybody listening that's not saved, Lord, that you might deal with them. Lord, that they might come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. All right. Good night, folks. Uh, hang in there.